Hello, everyone. Good day to everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on this awe-inspiring section, Pipeline R&D Today. On the behalf of the Rio Pipeline Conference, I'd like to thank you for being with us here today to discuss the hot issues of our industry. When I say here, just means that uh, wherever you are in this 100% digital edition. A special appreciation to our speakers who will share their insights with us today. My name is Celso Raposo. I'm currently the director of LRQA do Brazil, and I have more than 30 years experience in pipelines and oil and gas industry. I'm honored to moderate this section. R&D today is the tomorrow of our industry. And now we are going to have a vision of the work we are doing today to pave the way for our future. But not one vision, four visions. To start our journey, let's me introduce our speakers Mr. Marion Erdlin Pepler, she is the Secretary General of the European Pipeline Research Group, EPRG, in which she is responsible for the strategy of the group and international collaboration. Mrs. Erdlin is a principal engineer with Rosen Group. She has over 20 years' experience in pipeline industry. She had the Department for Mechanical Tests and Fracture Mechanics and has extensive experience in topics related to pipeline, safety, development of testing methods. Her recent focus is on hydrogen related topics. And within Rosen, she is heading the hydrogen focus group and is driving the direction of the dedicated hydrogen testing lab in Lincoln, Germany. Mr. Cliff Johnson. Yeah. Mr. Cliff Johnson joined the Pipeline Research Council International, PRCI, as president in September 2010. He previously served as director of public affairs at NACE International. Mr. Johnson's legislative career includes position with Texas State Senator Gregory Luna, U.S. Congress Human Connie Morella, U.S. Senator Kay Bailey Hudson, and the governor of Texas, Anne Richards. Under Mr. Johnson's leadership, PRCI's membership has grown over 75 members across the globe. And in 2015, he led the creation of the Technology Development Center in Houston. In uh, 2019, he developed the strategic research priority to enable PRCI members to drive the execution of strategic research results efforts. In 2021, he launched a new initiative, Emerging Fuels Institute, a consortium of industry members driving research to enable the energy transition. Mr. Johnson earned his Master of Public Affairs from Lyndon Baines Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Austin College in Chairman, Texas. He has obtained his Certificate Association Executive designation and is active in the American Society of Association Executives. He resides in Northern Virginia, US, with his wife, Courtney, and five children, Emma, Oleg, Vivian, Lena, and Hannah. Next one will be Mr. André França, Executive Director at Pipeline Technology Center, CETEDUT. Mr. França holds an MBA in Business Management from uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio, uh, a degree in physics from Rio de Janeiro Federal University. He has been working for companies in the oil and gas industry for over the past 18 years, both technical, man uh, technical and management roles. Before starting in oil and gas, he started his career as research in Brazilian Center of Physical Research. After that, he was hired by a pipeway, a pipeline inspection company, working on shore and offshore pipeline as inspectors and the different, held the different management positions. Uh, he held commercial positions working for flexible pipe manufacturers and uh, continued to work in commercial teams for other companies such as Innovation Norway, Acker Solutions. In 2012, he took over the general management position for the Brazilian branch of the Norwegian company Ike and testing. Then we'll, we close the section presentations with uh, Dr. George Campello, 
Currently, he is the riser and subsea flexible pipe technology consultant for Petrobras R&D Center and a professor of Petrobras University. Campello is a fully qualified civil engineer, master and doctor in offshore structure with more than 25 years engineering experience. For the past 18 years, he has worked with subsea engineering to develop new technologies, math and calculation tools in the design and qualification process as well as flexible pipe integrity assessment. In addition, he is the leader of uh, methodology discipline in Petrobras for stress corrosion cracking CO2 program. In this whole, he has coordinated the development of remaining life prediction methods in conjunction with manufacturers, academy, as well as flexible pipe digital twins technology, which will automize and integrate flexible pipe integrity management. So now we'll start the presentations with uh, Mr. Marion Erlen Pepler. The floor is yours. Thank you. So I will share my screen and I hope you see the presentation now. In full screen mode now. Okay, so um, I would like to talk about one of the most important R&D areas that EPRG is currently working in. And um, it's an example for the typical way that R&D um, is worked through in, in EPRG. And it is obviously related to hydrogen. That's one of the major topics here. And I'll just quickly start by talking why hydrogen now. We're seeing so much of a rush towards the research in the direction of hydrogen. And this is obviously because hydrogen has a lot of advantages, um, also in comparison to natural gas, but also when it relates to, to climate change and, and carbon footprint reduction. So it's the important thing is that hydrogen is a gas too, as is natural gas. So there's a lot of things we know, but there are also a couple of things which we don't know. And this is why we need to go for some R&D. A difference in this area here is that it is heavily driven by politics. So that, that's not a normal way in which, um, for instance, EPRG does its research. Usually the initiatives come out of the membership. In this case here, there is very clearly also a heavy political drive in that direction. And it's actually hung up very high in the European Commission. And there's a lot of political initiatives which have formed around, which try and focus the um, initiatives, focus the, the industry, um, give room for collaboration, and also initiate their own projects from time to time. There are lighthouse projects um, all over the place. What you see here are some German examples. Um, there are examples in every other country in Europe too, where mostly driven by politics, big initiatives actually aim at um, constructing the first um, industrial loops or um, hydrolysis or whatever else it might be. Um, another player in the game, and all of this is obviously European based, it's probably transferable to any part of the globe. Um, the next player in the game then is standardization bodies, where I just have two examples here. Again, DVGV is a German one and DNB is the obviously well-known offshore body in, in um, Norway. And then we have ourselves and other organizations like GERGE here, or also PRCI and APGA, we all collaborate and work together mostly directed on our own continent, but then also collaboratively on the, the overall topic. The European hydrogen strategy is already very well formulated. Um, I'm not going to go any in a lot of detail here, but you can see that we're talking about a relatively short timeline, actually, when you see that from today to 2024, there are already goals which are set, 2030, the next goals where it's really moving um, into different parts of the industry uh, and so on. And then from 2030 onwards, the plan actually is to produce renewable hydrogen on a relatively large scale. So that's a very ambitious plan. Um, not everybody is sure it will actually move forward that quickly, but it also tells you that it is going to move and it's also going to move really quickly when there is this heavy push here. Now, one of the main questions was, is this a new part of the industry? And the answer is no, it's not really. There are hydrogen pipelines all over the globe. There are 2,600 kilometers in the US. There are 1,600 kilometers in Europe. There are another 300 and something kilometers in the rest of the world. So overall, it's quite a large number. 
And the plan for Europe actually is to move to around about 40,000 kilometers um, in the next, let's say, around about 20 years. Again, this is an ambitious target. Um, the lines are going to serve many parts of the industry. They're going to transport hydrogen to households. And the plan is to produce it from renewables, as you see here. And the idea actually is that we will make use of the existing grid because it's a very valuable asset and it makes all sense in the world to actually make use of it. But in the end, there will also be um, a share of around about 30% of newly built hydrogen lines. That's also important to know. And I'll just whiz through a little bit of detail. Again, this is ambitious. We're talking about 2030 here. It's less than 10 years to go. And we're looking at something like 11,000 kilometers of hydrogen lines um, in that time frame. And remember the number just now, we have around about 1,500 kilometers now. So it's almost doubling the number. That's relatively ambitious. This is sort of based around the existing industrial hubs. Um, very much focused on the industry, not so much on the households. Many of these are already existing pipelines. If you look this up, you will see the color code behind and it shows you that some of this is repurposed. No, most of this here is repurposed and some will be new lines in the early stages. And then as it expands, it starts to spread out throughout Europe. Um, again, mixing up um, repurposed and new lines. And you see that the UK now plays a larger role. And you see that the net over continental Europe is actually um, expanded. And then if you look at 2040, which was the, the end point, so to speak, of the planning right now, we're up to about 40,000 40, kilometers of hydrogen lines, um, which is around about tripling or a bit more than tripling the number. And if you look at this hydrogen backbone, you just go and Google it, and that number is probably not correct any longer. It's almost as if daily you find further plans on um, newly built or repurposed hydrogen lines. So I'm going to move over to EPRG now. I said it's um, heavily pushed by politics, which is important and which also changes the game just that little bit. Um, but it's more of an um, assistance uh, to the overall target than anything else. So what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of minutes is what we as the European Pipeline Research Group actually make of this goal to serve the industry with a pipeline grid which is capable of transporting the hydrogen. Just very shortly, this is the European Pipeline um, Group, EPRG. We consist of um, 29 member companies, uh, mostly operators, they are the largest group, and manufacturers, second largest groups, and three service provide, four service providing companies um, are also shortly members of EPRG. So we are actually uh, known for almost 50 years, it's our anniversary next year, um, for making use of the um, member um, companies and their expertise to go ahead with the bet to produce the best results for the industry. So I just said, is it new or not? Well, there are hydrogen lines and they need to be converted. So the question is, how can I actually do it? Um, can I just stick to what I've always been doing? The answer is no, because the lines we talked about earlier clearly are product lines. And what we're talking about is transmission lines. That's a bit of a different animal. You can make use of some of the things you know, but you will also have to learn a lot more about how you actually then build and also operate the lines. And these are the questions that we're trying to answer in the end. It's a very focused um, research that we're up to, um, but it's going to be important because once you produce hydrogen, you will also need to transport it. And the transmission grid is going to be very important for that task. So what we did first actually is a very typical way of, of um, starting up any research initiative is to look at um, what's already existent, um, a literature survey. By the way, this is downloadable for free from the EPRG website in case anybody's interested in that. Um, and we had a look at all of the threats. Again, some of these are known because it is a gas, but others are totally new because they are related to hydrogen and what it does to steel. So after these threats are known, we looked at the code guidance. Um, there is some code guidance which is available. Um, firstly and foremostly, it is the ASME B3112 standard. Um, and there is uh, IGA guidelines which are specific to Europe. And what you see here, and you probably can't read it, but it's just a collection of paragraphs which are um, difficult to follow when you really want to repurpose or build up a new hydrogen grid. And 
We have, as EPRG, we've chosen some of these paragraphs here, which we want to challenge with the work that we're doing in the near future, which will then make life easier or hopefully reduce some conservatism or potentially also add some conservatism just in case there is not enough in the existing standard. So well, very, no, no. Focused, very focused um, things that we're looking at. And we took it one step deeper and coming from there with the idea of what the threats are and what the standards are actually uh, prescribing right now, we created an EPRG hydrogen roadmap. Um, this is the um, condensed version of it, so to speak. And we have identified the technically most relevant areas which are either not covered well enough or not existing in the code or which we think are too conservative or whatever. And out of all of these, we've chosen, again, the most important ones, which we're just um, launching projects on. Um, although I showed you in the initial slide that there are a lot of initiatives, um, we have still found a very sensible area which is not covered up to now and where we think that our membership is going to create most value. And this is sort of bridging the laboratory test for which you find a lot in the literature and the real world, so to speak, the pipeline itself, for which you do not find a lot anymore. And we have all the operating companies with all the knowledge and know-how that they have, and we have testing companies with us too, which will be able to perform um, a good project um, to, to come out and actually answer many of the important questions here when it comes to transferability of already known laboratory type stuff to um, the real world pipeline um, integrity. So these are the areas which we're starting off with, but actually I'm going to almost going to say, or I'm going to say that more importantly than this, this is going to be a large bit of work. It's going to be one of the largest ever funded projects by EPRG, but I think more importantly is actually this one here. And this one again relates back to the first slide I had saying a lot of work is ongoing. Our member companies are mostly doing bilateral work um, with R&D companies on their own. Um, other initiatives are working, other groups are working, and the most important thing will be to identify from the beginning on, so from the project planning stage on, or from the identification stage of what am I planning on doing, through the project stage, what are others doing, can we combine the work, can we collaborate, can we throw the results together, can we draw common conclusions, and can we then take them forward to standardization so that we have the same safety in the hydrogen line grids all over the world in a couple of years. I think this is the most important role which EPRG can play together with others. And this is something which we have, um, yeah, which we're going to do in the next couple of years. And that's it Thanks. from my side for today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mario, for your very good presentation. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Cliff Johnson. The floor is yours. You are on mute, Cliff. It's probably better on mute. It's better that way to learn learn a lot when I'm just quiet. It's always good. <laughs> well, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, Kelso. Appreciate the invitation, and we're going to build a lot, a lot of what Marion just talked about and where the hydrogen is going. But what I want to do is also provide a perspective of the grandness of the opportunity. There is a lot going on in the hydrogen space, and I will mention that in our presentation as well at PRCI. Uh, as Marion mentioned, one of the key levers, though, is collaboration. And I'll give a brief story of who PRCI is to make sure we're all on the same basis. PRCI is a nonprofit association started in 1952, and we cover a global basis, looking at the pipeline assets and with the fullness of it there, looking at the full transportation of natural gas, hazardous liquids, biofuels, and now the next generation of, of energy that we're talking about. Looking at the research, and the key part here is making sure that we technology transfers, what we're talking about today and other opportunities, is not just sharing with the community, but also getting beyond our traditional pipeline base and sharing what we're doing to advance the safety and the priorities of our industry. The council, when we look at the council part of PRCI, it really is the sharing the learnings that we have with our membership diversified across the globe. We're able to pull upon the best and the brightest anywhere there is to solve the problems that we're facing. And as I mentioned several times already, we're a multinational activity. We have members all across the globe that drive the success and the importance of PRCI. Today, roughly 60% of the world's transmission pipeline operators are part of PRCI, which gives us a unique opportunity to help lead into it. Again, 60% of the world's transmission pipelines. So if we're gonna drive the solutions, this is the body that needs to be doing that. This, the mission here is important to keep in mind. 
this is how we drive the organization and where we're trying to get to is that provide that relevant innovative solutions to really shift the industry to the next level of safety. Here in North America, currently systems are 99.999% safe. We're talking about a very safe system. However, when there are failures, we do need to respond. We need to go better. We have to get 100%. That has to be the goal. Marion talked about hydrogen. And right now, our industry as a pipeline industry is at an inflection point. We have to maintain our current assets because energy is going to be in many forms going forward. Hydrogen is just one issue that we're going to be looking forward to. We still need to be able to move natural gas and hazardous liquids safely and efficiently. So there has to be a two-pronged approach to research. One, looking at what we're doing for the current research programs to make sure we have the assets that we need as long as we need them for the, the hydrocarbons that we have in the system today. And then next, we need to be able to pivot and to allow the, the flourishment of the next emerging fuels, again, hydrogen or whatever other system it may be for the next generation of fuels. So this inflection point is part of the conversation you'll see me talking about in the next several years and where we're going as an industry. But specifically today, keep in mind, we have to do both paths equally and both paths efficiently. Otherwise, we're going to be missing something and missing out on a key opportunity. Let me spend a few minutes and talk about our core research program. PRCI has a great diversification, as I mentioned before. We cover all assets from the design, the zero materials and constructions through the total operating life of the asset. Looking at how do we maintain it? How do we make more out of it? How do we ensure the safety and integrity? If there is a defect, how do we find it as soon as possible? Where do we go? What you see on this slide and the next slide are the technical committees that we have that allow us to drive through that. Pretty straightforward concepts, looking at compressor and pump stations, corrosion, design materials and construction, and integrity and inspection. Really looking at the fullness of the asset, not just the pipeline itself, but the associated facilities where a lot of the challenges have that we're out there. I mentioned about the inflection point between the hydrocarbons and, and moving of the new emerging fuels. The second thing, or the third thing I should say coming in is also that climate change conversation. How do we ensure the reduction of the greenhouse gases as part of the equation? And so that's where this is also comes into these equations here. On the next slide, really helps you dig into that. When you look at that measurement, that surveillance and operation and monitoring, underground storage and subsea, these are all parts of that discussion on the environmental aspect as well. Continue to push in these areas, these eight important technical areas for us to drive the conversation. Each of these areas currently have about 25 to 30 research projects involved. I encourage you when you have time to go on our website to learn more about it. And with the time that we have this morning, I won't go into great detail because of that, but I encourage you to go to the website because there's a lot here that shows the great steps that the industry is taking, but there's still more to be done, as I said before. Continue to push the envelope and continue to shift. Within those eight areas, we've defined currently three strategic research priorities. These are large, significant areas that helps move us aggressively towards that 100%. The first one that we began was the looking at the optimization, the detection of, and mitigation of mechanical damage. As many of us know, this is the issue where we have a third party strike on our line. How do we know when it's time to replace, repair, and to modify that system? But it's not just the mechanical damage impact that we're looking at, it's also now looking at all the associated things when it has a crack or has corrosion. Can we find those interacting threats with the tools that we have today? One of the outputs from this effort will be a first ever uh, document that shows you the current state of the art of inline inspection tools. What can they do? How can they identify? And what processes they go through to understand what the impact that is? But it's just one output from the strategic research priority on mechanical damage. The second one here, as I mentioned before, is the greenhouse gas reductions. Looking at the best way we can do to make sure the system keeps all the product in the line as long as possible. But if it does get out, how do we know it as soon as possible to remediate and to address that disease as quickly as we can? Then the last one we have right now is crack management, exploring what we need to do to better understand cracks. This is a defect that is very challenging for our tools today. How do we continue to push the envelope of these tools to make them stronger, better, more effective? Again, with this one too, we'll also have the first ever report on our inline inspection tools and mechanical, excuse me, inline inspection tools and their ability to detect and size cracks effectively for us in our process. But it's not only the inline inspection tools that we need to work on that's being done in this project, it's also the other non-destructive evaluation tools that we have outside the pipe. And how do we have those two married together to continue to advance our safety and our opportunities? These three priorities are important for us today as an industry to continue with our current assets to ensure their life and their integrity there when we need them. 
as Marion mentioned, and I'll go into in a second on the emerging fuels conversation, is really using the current asset to move forward. But to do that, we need to make sure that integrity is strong before we introduce hydrogen or any other emerging fuel into the system. We do have two other current SRPs in development that are significant issues that are facing our industry. One is looking at geohazard management. How do we better understand the impact of ground movement shifting of waterways to the impact on those on our systems to understand what we need to do and how to remove those more effectively? The last one is kind of goes a little bit more into in with the greenhouse gas reduction is the liquid and gas leak detection to be able to understand and to identify as soon as possible the defect of that area. But also it's not just the detection of the leak, it's also going back to that mitigation and that prevention before it happens to ensure we don't have any leaks. But if we do, we wanna make sure we find it as soon as possible. So these two SRPs that are in development, we hope to have them ready for consideration for the, our executive assembly sometime in 2022 to allow us to begin advancing the industry in the key areas, in these key areas as well. The three on the top will have, we complete the end of 2022 and be able to provide resources to the industry to help drive those conversations. The two on the bottom that are in development, hopefully we'll have those in queue and be able to have them complete in 2025. They take about three to five years to mature and so we're hoping to drive that to completion. What I wanna do is kind of hit that inflection point now. Let's go spend some time on what we're doing to help with the emerging fuels discussion. Marion did a really great job of walking you through the hydrogen conversation of what's being considered. And as she mentioned, hydrogen is nothing new. We've been doing hydrogen research, at least in the US, since the 1970s. In the uh, 1970, PRCI was in conjunction with the Department of Energy and done some of the first research on how to transport and move this important product. It kind of languished as with natural gas and hazardous liquids prices were able to be more economical and more efficient which was a great way to go. Now we're seeing a, a return to the hydrogen conversation, which is important, but there's a lot of research we can build upon. And there's a great uh, document that PRC has pulled together that kind of looks at the historical research programs that have been done. So if you're looking for that, please reach out and we can provide that for you. But we've also began looking at how do we do it, not just in the North American, as, as uh, Marion said, how do we globalize this conversation? This is the first time that policy is dictating research agenda and research timing. And that is different than we've ever had in our industry before. And usually we have identified the problems and we solve the problems, similar to what Marion said for UPRG. This time we have artificial dates set upon us that are important from our external partners. Now we need to make sure technically we can help get there. We can't be the agents of no in this case. We have to be agents of yes, maybe. How do we need to do it? What research constraints do we have? As Marion said, there are currently a lot of operations of hydrogen pipelines globally that were purpose-built lines. We believe at PRCI that purpose-built lines definitely have a grill going forward, and we have a lot of good science around those. ASME B12, as very important, has a really good documentation of what to do when you build it. But as we One begin minute, to, Cliff. Thank you, sir. As you begin to transition with this opportunity and look at what we're doing here, then the opportunity begins to think about what is it that we need to think about for the next fuels using in our current systems. A lot of the maturity of our pipelines, we know, have some challenges with putting new products in. And so here is what we're doing with inside PRCI. We've created the Emerging Fuels Institute. This is a body of the members that allows those who are really aggressively entertaining this opportunity, which not all of our members are, to move into this space and to move down this quickly. Down at the bottom is some of the current scope that shows you similar to what Mary pointed out, looking at the materials that we're looking at for hydrogen, and what we're gonna be doing for emerging fuels, renewable natural gas, or other fuels of the future. The facilities associated with this, because there will be a huge impact on the facilities of these new products looking at the safety devices, looking at some of the requirements for fire safety, and then the downhole reservoir and the cavern stores that we think about. Currently within the Institute, we have five members. We have Saudi Ramco, PG&E, TC Energy, SoCal Gas, and Enbridge. And they have committed a significant amount of money to begin the process to drive this forward currently. We have a meeting today later on with the, our executive assembly to talk about the next steps for the Institute and how do we broaden out that membership to include the totality of our organization and others around the globe. The last thing I'm gonna spend some time on is a center that we created in Houston back in 2015 to really leverage the industry's resources. We've done research since the 50s, as I mentioned, and we've had assets that we've built, purpose-built for research, looking at how do we test tools, how do we test new ideas, and they've been spread out around the world, which has been great. However, we haven't used them repeatedly and really built upon that research. What we did in 2015 was it established the Technology Development Center in Houston, Texas. This is a 20,000 square foot facility on an eight and a half acre lot that allows us to test tools and their capabilities to the ultimate ability. 
As you can see here, you have the ability to show the NDE tools above ground outside the pipe, really how they work for the first time in an open air environment for a wide audience to see. Second, we have now have pull strings and flow loop capabilities that allow tools to be tested at real speeds and real capabilities. The critical part isn't the assets, the tools, and the facilities, those can be built anywhere. But now that we have an inventory of almost 12,000, almost 15,000, 1,500, excuse me, like pipe samples from around the globe that help us understand the true defects and test tools against those real defects. These defects have not only singular, but also interacting threats to allow those challenges. So with the pool strings, we have the capability to go from eight inch to 42 inch. We can do full capability speed for the tools to be able to run through it and really see what we can find out. On the flow loop, we mentioned two on the screen. There's actually three today. We have a 12, a 16, a six, and a 10 inch flow loop that are able to then test and verify current tools and future tools that are being developed. This is at this facility is both for members and non-member use. And we've seen a lot of opportunities for people outside of PRC to come and use this to verify new technologies, new entrants into our industry on how we can move forward. So if you have some opportunities, I encourage you to come visit and share time with us as well. These last two slides, I'm not gonna read through them, give you some of the specifications. So as you download the presentation, I encourage you to take a look and see some more details on each of these assets that are critically important to the success of the TDC. With that, Kelso, I'll turn it back to you, Kelso, excuse me, and let the next speaker come on board. Thank you, Kelso. Thank you very much, Cliff. It was very interesting, uh, merging fuels and uh, the TDC. Now the next presenter is uh, Mr. Andrea França from CETEDUT. The floor is yours. Andrea, you are on mute. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, much better this way. Sorry about that. So I'm now sharing the screen. Can you see my screen now? We're good, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Good morning, you all. So I'll uh, talk about a little bit about uh, uh, City Dude and, uh, and some highlights of the projects ongoing there and, and projects from the past. Uh, first of all, I, I would like just to present a little bit about uh, City Dude. That is a, a shared laboratory model for technology development. It's a non-profitable organization that was founded by Transpetro, Puki, Rio, Petrobras, uh, and with using funding from FINAP and nowadays we count on, a, on a, an amount uh, of around 20 uh, supporters and, and associates. It's in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So uh, it's in an industrial area, very close uh, 25 kilometers from the international airport, 35 minutes from Rio downtown. Uh, it's uh, close to Transpetro Terminal of uh, Campos Elysius. It's a very strategic location. Uh, we have there uh, this, uh, we have a workshop that can be shared to form a, a maintenance and, and assembly of equipment uh, here, an aerial view of uh, City Dude, being pointing uh, uh, with a number of the laboratories that I'm going to show you afterwards. So we even have a, a riser here for, for testing uh, and a facility for a conference room. Uh, that can go up to 70 seats and the classroom drop 25 seats. Uh, going through the labs, uh, lab one is a, a 14 inch loop, 100 meters long uh, with uh, interchangeable spools with a uh, manufactured uh, metal losses. Uh, we can interchange those spools by uh, specific features like these uh, metric bands that we can check for big in uh, passage. We can make uh, up to one meter per second runs there, to test pigs and, uh, and other equipment also outside the pipeline. Uh, we have lab two, that is a, a pool retest that you can go 
from a six inch up to 16 inch standard, but we can also do like in this picture here, we can go up to 28 uh, uh, inches for, for tests of uh, uh, pulling uh, pigs with a winch that can go up to 20.5 tons. So these are the specifications of lab two. Lab three is the 2.7 kilometers long uh, test loop that is 2.2 uh, of it is buried. So all this yellow line along up to the to the hill is uh, 60 meters uh, uh, above sea level, and uh, all the yellow line is a buried pipeline. So here in the picture you can see part of a test that I will highlight, and uh, we have also these interchangeable spools that we can change for spools with defects, or even this one that is a, a transparent spool that was used by Shell. So these are the, the specifications of our lab three. Lab four is the bunker. We can go up to a thousand bar for forming burst tests uh, on uh, repaired pipelines or pipelines with specific defects. Uh, we can also go for cycling and uh, all the data is acquired by on a, on a uh, monitoring room. So this is lab four specs. Lab five is the prothetic, uh, cathodic protection uh, field. Uh, there we, we have the node bands, rectifiers, control panels, uh, uh, pipes and trails and everything. And also we have a specific room for training and examination. These are specs for lab five. And I'm gonna share highlights of a few projects, three projects in, the, in fact that uh, are ongoing now at TD Dude. So uh, this one is one that is unfolding as we speak. Uh, this is the subsea automatic pig launcher uh, developed by NOV. So NOV developed this pig launcher uh, for four pigs, a thousand meters water depth. And now they are making a prototype for uh, to increase that to 10 pigs and 3000 meters water depth. Idea here is uh, to have unmanned ways to send pigs from the seabed to the platform. Uh, and this will be done at Citadut by replacing our launcher by this equipment and they're making all the adjustments for pig detection for all the system that will impel the pigs to, to go uh, through automatically. And then they will go for a few tests under sea uh, close to uh, NOV facility. The other highlights a leak, a leak detection uh, uh, by optical fiber made by OptiSense. This was uh, here is part of the 12 inch loop that was uh, uh, exposed. So we could install this, uh, this spool. Uh, this spool turned into a, a, like a flute, a lot of holes and each hole were assembled with the valve and those valves simulated the, the, the leaks and the leaks were detected at our control room uh, using the fiber optical. So uh, OptiSense came down to do that because they could not find another place where they could make holes in the, the pipe and then bury again to detect the signals. And this is a project that recently finished, the, uh, but we, we see that there is a potential for future development. So we are thinking of, of proposing a JIP. So uh, this was made to test uh, 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 to, to study the black powder mitigation and, and all the kind of solid particles in pipelines. So this, this uh, is a completely separate lab that was made to simulate natural gas flow using uh, compressed air. Uh, there, here we have a, a, redis, a reduction pressure station. This is to simulate the, a delivery point. And then we studied all the, the behavior of all the data like the moisture, uh, uh, pressure, flow rates, uh, using the, 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 the filtration and monitoring to see the best way of uh, achieving the maximum removal of solid particle. And for the road ahead, we see that uh, we, we are seeking out uh, more opportunities for proposing uh, 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 JIP. So this is not the most common way of performing uh, uh, performing projects at, at Cedidut so far, but we see that this is the, the way to go. 
we need to be getting close to SIPC and pipeline 4.0 related challenges. So we see a lot of potential for C to do that also performing uh, projects related to, to, to sub C. Uh, supporting the development of startups in need of real scale facilities. So this is something that is already ongoing. Uh, we, we will start this uh, with an initiative called Baby Tech uh, that uh, we will unlock this, that this has been always uh, like uh, the, the function of, of City Dude uh, uh, to, to have those uh, startups incubated there. But with Baby Tech, we managed to not only give the technical support and incubating support, but also uh, support uh, like a mentorship and, and things like that to the, to the incubated companies. And fostering the interaction of pipeline operations of all sectors, because as we see, uh, all the uh, the different sectors like mining or distribution and, and transportation of gas, they have different challenges, but uh, in a way, uh, uh, those challenges may superpose and we may have a, a good, uh, good result from the increasing this exchange of information among all sectors. One minute, Andre. I'm finishing. Okay. Excellent. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, next speaker is Mr. is Dr. Campello. So the floor is yours. Hey, Celso, thank you. Andre, could you stop share, please? Can you see my screen, also? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Celso. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be here. Represent Petrobras in the center. Today, I'm gonna talk about one of the challenges facing Petrobras in, in operation with flexible pipes and the corresponding R&D initiatives. The flexible pipe is a multi-layer pipe composed of uh, metallic and polymeric layers. And uh, there is a confined space between polymeric layers, uh, the inner and the, uh, the outer pressure shift, which is called the annulus space, and where carbon steel armors are placed. Uh, if the, the transported fluid contains high concentration of CO2 under high pressure and temperature, the CO2 can permeate through the, the internal pressure shift, reaching this, this analyze space. So uh, if the water ingresses into this analyze space, it creates the condition to occur the stress concentration, uh, the stress corrosion crack induced by, by CO2. It's a very new failure mechanism with no reference in the international flexible pipe standards. But what, what were the required, required conditions uh, for this phenomenal occurrence? Uh, first of all, the susceptible material, uh, attractive stress, uh, a corrosive environment, in this case, high CO2 content in presence of water. And finally, finally uh, an often uh, operational time to trigger the, the, the phenomenon. <laughs> When Petrobras was faced with uh, this new mechanism, the company created a robust integrity management program to mitigate the risk and maintain operations. This program is strongly supported by intense R&D investments, and the Petrobras R&D initiatives related to the SCCCO2 have based on these five disciplines. Uh, the first one is uh, material qualification. The objective here is to deter determine the safe envelope in which the pipe can operate without, without the, the occurrence. Safe life methodology, uh, when the pipe is within the, the, the envelope where the phenomenon uh, occurs, it's necessary to determine the remaining safe life. 
So the objective of this, this discipline is to develop a methodology to predict the time that the pipe can safely operate. Inspection tools, uh, the objective here is to develop inspection tools capable to identify the analyst condition if the, the analyst is flooded or dry. New concepts and material uh, in conjunction with the with suppliers, the objective is to develop its flexible pipe, flexible pipe immune to the SCC CO2. And digital twin, that's the initiative to develop technology to assess the pipe performance in real time based on digital twin techniques. To better understand the condition within which the phenomenon occurs, several small and full scale tests under a range of, of stress and CO2 levels have been carried out. The objective was to determine the safe zones where the mechanism does not trigger. And based on these studies, Petrobras and the, and the manufacturer have identified a safe envelope for the most used flexible pipe materials in pre salt production. But for, for that pipes which exceed the safe zone, a remaining safety life prediction is needed to be used as input in a, in a risk assessment. So, um, Petrobras has developed and certified its own methodology and simulation tool to predict the, 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 the SCCCO2 safety life. The methodology is based on two foundations, the critical crack size, which corresponds to the failure criteria, and the crack growth rate. Based on these two pa parameters, we can predict the maximum pep, pep, the maximum pep operation life by calculating the time the, the crack would take to reach the critical size. As the phenomenon has almost no experimental data available, the strategy to develop the methodology consists of dissecting and analyzing the material, the corrosion and cracks found in retrieval the pipe and correlate all this data with the operational condition under which the pipe had been subjected. Therefore, a huge amount of material characterization data and corresponding operational condition were analyzed and a, data, a database created. So by applying artificial intelligence techniques on this database, a model to predict the crack growth rate was properly established and used to predict the remaining life. <laughs> As the SCCCO2 is a phenomenon that can only occur in presence of water, Knowing if the flexible pipe analysis is flooded or dry is a crucial information to the integrity management. Therefore, Petrobras has invested uh, to develop tools capable to inspect the pipe to know the endless condition. Based on these initiatives, Petrobras has already developed, in conjunction with the industry, uh, inspection tools uh, to be applied in lines with no insulation tapes. For gas injection line, for instance, the inspection service is already in operation. <laughs> but due to the complexity to, do, to differentiate the endless condition in pipes with thermal insulation tapes, for insulated the pipe, the qualification process and the field test are still ongoing. In this video, we can see uh, a test, one of these, these, these two, a field test. Another important initiative to develop uh, new flexible pipe concepts include new materials such as stainless steel and composite materials. In this initiative, the operators and manufacturers are in a joint effort to develop and qualify these new flexible pipe concepts. Here uh, in the screen, we can see three examples. Uh, the first, uh, a corrosion resistant flexible pipe that adopts a traditional design but substitute the carbon steel for stainless steel. Uh, the second uh, is a hybrid flexible pipe. This concept is a combination of an internal monolithic composite layer reinforced by carbon fiber with uh, uh, steel tensile armors. And the last uh, is a full composite pipe, another concept that consists of a monolithic pipe made of carbon fiber thermoplastic composite material.
Uh, regarding the, the, the digital twin initiatives, uh, we may say that the future of the subsea system is strongly linked to the data and disciplines integration through digital tools. In this sense, technologies based on digital twins and artificial intelligence techniques appears to be one of the most important initiatives to support the integrity management that will provide real uh, time assessment, uh, identify patterns and trends uh, using intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, automatize the uh, remaining life calculation and support a risk-based inspection program. Petrobras is, is developing a flexible, pipe, a flexible pipe digital twin focus on both failure mode, SCCCO2, and fatigue. This slide illustrates the data integration scan and the whole process for the automatic remaining set life prediction using real-time operation data inputs. Data such as pressure, temperature, and CO2, as well as vessel movements and position, are collected from the sensor, from the, uh, from sensor installed in the, in the platform. And all these data are automatically oh, processed. Minutes, okay, so all these data are automatically processed by simulators that carry out flow diffusion, global and local analysis of the pipes. By integrating the inputs and outputs throughout the whole simulation process and apply an artificial intelligence model, the system can predict both CO2 and fatigue remain lives, providing relevant information to take integrity management decisions. To evaluate the potential benefits in terms of life extension by using digital twin technologies, pilot analysis considering uh, real operational data have been performed. For fatigue life, uh, by processing a four inch pipe in free catenary configuration, we obtained an increase of 83% in fatigue life. For SCCCO2, for instance, we have obtained 77% of, of uh, life extension. So uh, this result shows the, the huge benefits of the technology, which work in conjunction with remote monitoring system represents a powerful digital tool to make an even more robust the integrity management system. To finish, to conclude, uh, we can say that when we look to the future, we can foresee subsea pipeline system based on new concepts and materials with operations supported by integrity management system based on intelligent and integrated digital tools, autonomous inspection, and remote monitoring systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campello. Excellent presentation. Andrea, you also did a very good presentation. Thank you very much. So now we we are going to the questions and answers session. So we have uh, two questions, quick questions from the audience. One is, I think, is for Marion about uh, which standard to use when you have a blend of uh, gases like uh, hydrogen and natural gas. So strictly speaking, ASME B 3112 is applicable for blends as well as for 100% hydrogen. Um, the, the background to the standard is based on 100% hydrogen though. So there are ongoing um, initiatives, research projects and so on, which are specifically looking at blends to see if there is a degree of conservatism using ASME B3112, um, which, like I said, is based on the 100%. The, the first results indicate that when it comes to the pipeline material itself, I'm not talking about any other parts, really, only the pipeline material, you're not going to gain a huge uh, lot of, um, let's say, room when you go from 100% down to a blend. Okay, thank you. Another one, I think is general, is any R&D center in the world working on the composite pipes instead of steel pipes for natural gas, which can avoid many issues like cracks, corrosion, and so on? Most of what we discuss here. 
Yeah, there's a couple of groups that do the more on the composite side. They're on the distribution focused areas. And so in the United States, there's two groups that are heavily involved in it, the Gas Technology Institute, GTI, or a group called NYSEARCH, which is in the Northeast part of the United States. Both of them have the composite pipe research programs that move in this space as well, but it's really not for transmission pipeline because the pressures we're trying to use really don't fit well with the composite pipe systems, but it's more on the distribution side. So yeah, there is work being done. And so if you're looking for more information, let me know and I can get you contacted with the right people at those two organizations if you need more details. Thank you, Cliff. Welcome. Anyone likes to complement? Uh, just uh, because it really is so uh, at City Dude, we are trying to get closer to the distribution companies here because we are aware that they are most fond of using those sites and uh, we are looking into that to to to, to uh, to expand the action for going and looking into composite uh, pipelines okay and a, lot well, of we have distribution, a lot of plastics being used so there is definitely some opportunities there for to do to help in the latin american space to really drive some conversations uh, but it is going to take some work and it's going to be interesting to see as we migrate to new fuels what do we need to think about is that how we need to, what constraints they may have because we're seeing some different behaviors with the composites with some of the newer fuels as well so it just depends on where we go but that's great to hear andres that you guys are exploring that it's a great opportunity okay uh, excellent we cover already rich pipes transmission pipes uh, flexible pipes so it was a very good section Indeed. We still have four minutes to, to go and I'd like a final question with one minute to, to each one. That is, in your opinion, what are the new technologies such as IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, whatever you think, or a combination of them that will lead to a major modifications to the pipeline industry in the next 10 years? So one minute to each one. We can start with Marion. You are on mute, Marion. The most heard three words of the last couple of years. You are in mute, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm very, very convinced that management of data is going to play a larger and larger role. It's picking up right now. Many of us have lots and lots of data in different formats, and they are extremely valuable, um, potentially related to artificial intelligence to understand what's going on there. But this is going to be, I think, um, one of the game changers. It can be used everywhere. Um, also the digital twin that was talked about before moves that direction. This is where I think we're going to see um, large modifications and improvements. Okay, thank you. Cliff? No, I would agree with Mary that the data is the opportunity and it's interesting to look at because we've had reams of data and well, huge amounts of information historically. It's now how do you bring it together and make decisions based off data? Because that's really what we need to move towards. PRCI, one of the things we didn't talk about is really undertaking the next level of data and really begin a data sharing community on a virtual technology de 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 development center, similar to the physical one, we're just gonna do a virtual one, but bring a sharing in. So we're gonna bring in data from all the operators that we can to really share on various parts of the conversations because the data is important from one company to really learn itself, but also then we can share globally. That really is gonna advance the whole party. So data is really gonna be our next big uh, leap in information. And so as we go from where we are today, as I mentioned in North America, that 99.99% safe, that is going to get us to 100%. because we then be smarter where we put our inventory and activities into, because that's really the key thing is where do we need to pay our attention to? And the data will tell us that story. Andrea? Yeah, I agree with both. I think that the, the, the uh, data with the AI and everything is most handy because 10 years short term for pipeline. So this is the most uh, technology that it's at hand that is uh, analyzing, gathering and analyzing the information that is already there, that is already being uh, available, but not use it uh, because uh, otherwise for putting more sensors in the pipeline, more sensors in the system, this would take a bit longer and would be more uh, cost, uh, 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 it would be more expensive. So I think that in the short term is data. Yeah, and with the sensors too, as you know, Andreas, the more sensors you have is great, but now you have more data to interpret. So how do you figure out what's the right data, the right information at the right time? And that's really gonna be those next big questions. Cause again, we've had a huge amounts of data. Now, how do we understand what that means and how do we progress our industry? So that's really, and it's a great point that you made about more sensors isn't always the answer. It's how do we use the yeah. data from we have today even. So that's we, a great point. We need to bite what we have in hands first. That's it. Yeah. There you go. Hello. 
the last minute for you, right? Okay, so uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, IoT, uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence, digital twin, are powerful uh, tools to, to improve the, the integrity management system. But as I said before, in my opinion, a robust digital twin system depends on the, 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 the life prediction, but also depends on the remote monitoring systems. Uh, the lower accuracy of the prediction method, the greater the, the, the dependency of the monitoring system. I can give you an example, for instance, for fatigue life, uh, a robust digital twin would be in conjunction with the, the monitoring system like MODA that is, is capable to monitor the, the tensile structural condition. So there is no doubt the, the, the techniques like digital twin uh, uh, need to work integrated with the remote monitoring system. If we can uh, work all of these integrated, it will present a powerful tool to, to take integrity decisions. Thank you all guys. We finished the, the time we had. So my, my last remark is, will be based on what you said is exactly. Uh, the, the digital twins is as good as the numerical model that you have inside. And we are far be, uh, beyond to understand all the me failure mechanisms that we have today. So we still have uh, a long way ahead. So thank you all. Thank you for, especially for the speakers to their views today. We, we thank you very much for spending your time with us here and to all the audience that were with us here. And uh, we can uh, stay discussing this the rest of the day, but unfortunately our time is finished. Thank you all. See you. <laughs>